Iran, the Middle East and oil must all come to mind at once. Well, the East in the middle is actually West Asia, and Iran is soon to be known for petrochemical exports rather than oil exports. At least that's the plan. For Iran to be an oil-free economy rather than an oil economy. Iran hasn't been left with much of a choice. This country, however, had made its choice well before it was hit by sanctions. Yes, two and a half million barrels of crude exports in April 2018 have been reduced to a floating 200,000 barrels a day. A downward trend since the US pulled out of the nuclear deal in May of 2018. But Iran has had the vision for decades to break free from the hold of oil as a raw commodity. Why and what's the strategy to do so? Stay with me, Leila Faromarzi on Iran today for answers. It was as early as 1950 that Iran planned to reduce its overall economic dependence on oil revenues. And revolutionary Iran, post-1979 that is, has intended and attempted just that time and again. In 2019, Iranian President Rouhani presented a draft state budget of some $39 billion to parliament designed to limit dependence on oil exports in resisting U.S. sanctions. Mr. Abdul Maliki is an expert in economy and the stock market. He's here to give us a different insight into how oil revenues can be replaced by another, for better or for worse. During the last decade, we have decreased uh, uh, the dependence of the budget to the uh, export of crude oil uh, 90%. But now we have 10 percent um, actually uh, dependence of the budget, government budget on the uh, crude oil. We have two different uh, phrases about the crude oil dependence. The first one is the dependence of economy on the crude oil selling and the second one is the dependence of budget on the crude oil. The budget forecast revenues for oil, gas and condensates would fall by 40 percent. A 40 percent to be compensated by selling state properties and using state bonds. And the first half of 2020 has already seen action not only on the capital market but also in the industrial sector. Dr. Nardi is chief of the board of directors of a prominent pharmaceutical company. He and his company are living proof of how an oil embargo can be turned into an opportunity. We are importing about 150 million dollars worth of insulin pens. This figure is high and includes insulin glargan, insulin aspart and their mix. In the current calendar year, we started producing insulin glargan and by the end of the current calendar year, we will be manufacturing insulin aspart. Next calendar year, we will be producing Glorgan Aspart mix. In the second half of next calendar year, as required in the contract, we will start producing the active ingredients for Glorgan so that we would become self-sufficient in this sector. Some other means of increasing the government's finances are applying new tax laws and reforming hidden energy subsidies and selling off extra government assets. Of course, the energy subsidies being scrapped have caused problems in the past. Referring to petrol price protests. As far as industrial income goes, Puyesh Daru is an example of lucrative production. Some 50 busy bees are keeping up with their machines at this pharmaceutical factory to namely assemble insulin pens and plunge and label syringes as well as package the finished product. Insulin comes out as some 300,000 pens a week. We are talking two types of insulin to be joined by a third mixed type next year. The insulin and cartridge are domestically made at this factory and by next year the pens and sockets also should be. Of course, self-sufficiency does not mean that everyone has to be sourced domestically. 
Self-sufficiency requires you to develop the technology needed for a product and use it in favor of public welfare. We have already mastered the necessary technology for Glorgan production. We have already managed to save 10 to 20 million dollars from a total of 150 million spent on insulin pen imports. Next year, we hope to cut the $150 million by half as we would produce Aspart and Glorgan Aspart mix. I asked of secondary revenues to compensate for that part of the budget that has been lost to the government. Revenues other than from crude oil sales. Dr. Abbas Zadeh is planning deputy for the National Petrochemical Company. The petrochemical sector would be growing at a better pace in coming years. By March 2022, the raw hydrocarbon materials which we will be spending as feedstock in the petrochemical sector would equal to 1 million barrels per day of crude oil. By the end of the seventh development plan, the figure would grow to 2 million barrels a day of crude oil equivalent. Oil revenues will still be of use. By next year, they are to be used only for development projects, however, and to acquire capital assets. Talking of oil revenues, the oil market everywhere has been hit. While the U.S. has specifically brutally sanctioned Iran, which means secondary sanctions on anyone buying oil or doing business with Iran, global oil markets have been hit by lower demand due to the coronavirus. Iran has been hit doubly so. But this country is vaccinated to sanctions, given they have been resonating over the past 40 years. The blessing can be disguised as sanctions in any field. Mr. Ghanizadeh is an in charge of the National Rural Co-op Organization. <laughs> Regarding wheat, we have become self-reliant despite our high consumption. We have made good progress in the production of oil seeds. We can also reach self-sufficiency in rice production, so is the case with sugar. Today, we have reached self-belief in supplying our needs. Meantime, we have ended our dependence on oil. Our country is powerful in agriculture production. There are four seasons here, and rare are countries like Iran in terms of climate conditions. In the PP chain, which is being talked about widely today, we imported $350 million of petrochemical products last year. According to our estimates, these products would cost us about $1 billion by 2021. Our projects are based on market requirements, our projects are attracted to investors, and we hope to reach self-sufficiency in this sector. Over the past one decade, we could not even produce urea fertilizer, but we are now a producer of urea fertilizer. However, we are now moving towards products of higher value added. Production is less costly in Iran. We have qualified manpower and specialized forces. I mean that we enjoy good potential in terms of manpower in the country. Thanks to God, our universities and academic centers have trained qualified agriculture engineers. We have appropriate climate for some products. In some areas in our country, we have natural greenhouses. We are able to supply needs of regional countries and even Russia, and we have taken many steps in that direction. Just the latest bout of UN and Western sanctions began in 2006 to limit Iran's nuclear and missile programs. The nuclear program forever being claimed as peaceful. The sanctions were to be lifted in stages with the signing of the 2015 nuclear deal or JCPOA. The deal was to limit Iran's nuclear program in return for sanctions to be lifted off this country. Iran complied as attested by the UN nuclear watchdog, but the US still unilaterally and possibly illegally pulled out of the multilateral deal in 2018, reimposing and reinforcing UN sanctions as now US sanctions. That would be to force Iran into talks and a new nuclear deal. Now sanctions were on all but essentials, such as food and drugs. That has now changed. The most important sanctions uh, are imposed on the oil and banking system. Actually, we have some sanctions relative to the food and drugs, but uh, that are not uh, too much important for Iranian economy. 
because uh, actually more than 90% of the Iranian food has been produced uh, in Iran and are not imported. Uh, but uh, we are uh, necessary we, uh, and we need, but we need uh, actually foreign currency for importing uh, some uh, equipments and some machinery from uh, other countries. We need export uh, crude oil to achieve uh, actually foreign currency to uh, import that uh, necessary equipments and machineries. Strengthening the capital market and directing and encouraging people's capital to go to the stock market has been one of the things the government is doing and seems to have been successful in. The Iranian stock market has made surprising leaps over past years, especially the past two, unmatched globally even. And even now, with unfavorable conditions faced by the economy, it is still breaking records. Why? As you know, uh, regarding the budget deficit uh, in this year, uh, government is trying to sell uh, some assets in the capital market uh, and it has been so successful in this program because uh, the um, capital market in Iran is at this m uh, month very uh, good working and a lot of money has uh, come to, the, to this market. So Iranian government uh, actually decided to uh, supply a lot of shares and uh, assets and factories in uh, Iranian capital market for compensating uh, that uh, budget deficit. Some say the stock market's a great big bubble, but the government has every intention of putting that bubble together again should it burst. It is greatly because of incentive provided by the government that people are feeling psychologically secure and their participation in the stock market, therefore, has actually given that market a further boost. It has accelerated the growth of the stock market index, while discouraging people from operating in inflationary markets such as currency and gold markets. Time for a short break. We'll be back in no time. Hi, I'm Sharza Manucheri, and this is the news section of Iran Today. We'll be looking online for the latest update on Iran's move towards freeing its economy from petrodollars. Tehran Times reports Iran's free trade zones development continues despite sanctions. Considering the important role that the free trade zones play in promoting the country's export and employment, Iran is seriously pursuing development of its existing free trade zones and establishment of new zones as well. More development measures in this field have been taken since the U.S. reimposition of sanctions on the Iranian economy in November 2018, as Iran is reducing its dependence on the oil income while elevating its domestic production and non-oil exports. Although the sanctions have disrupted Iran's economic activities, they could not impede the development of Iranian free trade zones. In fact, the development of these zones have been even accelerated. Many strides made for increasing activities in the free trade zones have played a significant part in boosting the country's non-oil exports and brought prosperity in other economic sectors. Tassini News Agency claims over 70% of aircraft parts made in Iran, says Defense Minister. Iran has gained the technical know-how to manufacture more than 70% of airplane and helicopter components inside the country, a lawmaker quoted Defense Minister Brigadier General Amir Hatami as saying. Although Iran was not a manufacturer of planes and choppers, and despite the large variety of aircraft, the Islamic Republic has managed to manufacture the components for repair and overhaul of the aircraft, Abu Torabi quoted the minister as saying. The MP also noted that General Hatami gave an assurance that Iran is in perfect conditions in terms of defense capabilities and dismissed concerns about the defense industry. Iranian military experts and technicians have in recent years made great headways in manufacturing a broad range of indigenous equipment, making the armed forces self-sufficient in the arms sphere. 
Aluminum Insider uncovers how Iran aluminum production tops 275,000 metric tons of aluminum production over the past year. Iranian primary aluminum production skyrocketed this spring, jumping by almost 20,000 tons on the year to 60,677 metric tons across the months of mid-March through mid-May. Per domestic media, in the month ending on May 19th, Persian smelters turned out 30,647 metric tons, good for a year-on-year -year increase of almost 20,000 metric tons. For the calendar year prior to that date, Iran produced 275,716 metric tons of the non-ferrous metal. The industry minister estimated the value of Iran's aluminum sector at 22 billion US dollars, noting the country's self-sufficiency and valuable exports of the metal. Iran is the 18th in the world for domestic aluminum production, but the addition to Iralco's plant is expected to bump it four spots higher. That's all for this segment. We'll see you next week. We stopped at the stock market. One way of promoting the stock market has been the governments having directed manufacturing companies to use new financial instruments. This way, manufacture is also supported because the manufacturing sector needs a lot of capital, which the banking sector cannot fully finance. And big companies are glad to use new capacities in the capital market, a win-win situation. The good reception has led the government to announce that we will see more offers this year. And that is why the license for liberalizing justice shares to be offered in the stock exchange was also issued. Sanctions aside, why is it so important to free ourselves of the bond with crude oil revenues, this dependence on any raw natural resource actually? To avoid the Dutch disease, two words that can destroy the sustainability of a country's economy. Dutch disease is just one of the disadvantages of dependence on oil exports alone. Some others are low-cost imports, economic corruption among some profiteers, and declining productivity in oil-dependent organizations. The Iranian government has for years been well aware of the economic and even cultural disadvantages of dependence on oil revenues. To what extent has Iran acted on its awareness of the importance of freeing itself from oil dependence? I ask this of Mr. Abdul Maleki. The origin of the phrase Dutch disease is the Dutch economic crisis of the 1960s. It was after the discovery of the large Groningen natural gas field in 1959 that the manufacturing sector declined. This blessing was indeed a curse on manufacturing and agriculture, the traditional export sector that is. While the guilder, that's Dutch currency before the euro, became stronger, Dutch non-oil exports became consequently more expensive and therefore less competitive. Actually, at 1970s, uh, a huge amount of uh, revenue from uh, exporting crude oil has come to Iranian economy. Uh, so the government in that decade uh, made a mistake by uh, planning the long-term economic development uh, of the Iran uh, based on a, a flowing uh, uh, dollar stream to the Iranian economy. Right now, Iran is experiencing the exact opposite. Oil exports have dwindled, as has the value of the rial. The devaluation of the rial has meant goods becoming more expensive. But if it's brought one benefit, that is, that people are avoiding now excruciatingly expensive imported goods in favor of local products, prominently so in areas such as clothing. People are veering away from importing at any cost to production in any case. More production and manufacture make for a generative economy, one that can survive the long haul as well as create more jobs. One reason why the Gurejask oil pipeline is being regarded so highly. This 1,000 kilometer pipeline, 440 kilometers of which have already been built, is to transfer a million barrels of oil per day from the southern Iranian province of Boucher to the Iranian coast of the Oman Sea for exports.
The project envisages storage capacity of 10 million barrels of crude. It is important as customers want to know our oil will be ready for the taking at any time under any conditions. Parallel to this, Iran will have five pump stations which are also being built in Iran, and the oil conduit can carry condensates if necessary. Crude oil sales are to be replaced greatly by petrochemical produce. With $103 million worth of investment, the country's production capacity of petrochemicals will soar up to 107,000 tons. We are talking four petrochemical projects here. Iran promises 17 new petrochemical plants by the end of the year and to move from producing commodity substances to specialty produce. Do tell of the scope of Iran's petrochemical industry. The petrochemical industry's production capacity currently stands at 68 million tons. There are five categories of petrochemical products, namely polymers serving the downstream industry, fertilizers which are used in agriculture besides exporting chemical fertilizers, fuel, feedstock and chemicals, and aromatics. By the end of the sixth development plan in 2021, the rated production capacity of the petrochemical sector will reach 100 million tons. These four petrochemical projects include methylamine in Sangor, caustic soda flakes production plan in Mahshar, crystal melamine production plan in Lordegan, and a polyaluminium chloride production plan in Urmia. Although petrochems can also be embargoed, they are yet another source to find roundabout ways to sell, ways to bypass US sanctions and they are a source stemming not from imports but from industry, technological and economic power that is, which will serve to create jobs in often deprived areas. Iran's petrochemical revenues have reached $25 billion, oil minister Zangane said, and in 2025 petrochemical production is to reach $37 billion. <laughs> The 17 petrochemical projects are diverse. There are some methanol production projects amongst them. Three of them are to supply feedstock to petrochemical projects that would come on stream. One project pertains to catalyst production. We used to import catalysts, but startup of this project would end our dependence on imports. The catalyst is used in our polymer units. Several minor chemical projects will also come on stream this year. The plan to produce the Western Ethylene Line was approved in 2002. 1,660 kilometers long, it is actually the longest ethylene transmission line in the world and reaches from the south of Iran to Tabriz in the northwest. Zangane, the oil minister, said that ethylene production in the country is increasing, adding that this year ethylene production will reach 7 million tons. 2 million tons of which will be used in the Western line. Another disadvantage of the oil-dependent economy, which explains why we need an oil-free economy, is that the government has grown so much that most of the country's economy is in the hands of the government. It has overemployed not for efficiency but to create jobs, and it overspends. That is yet another reason for selling state-owned companies or offering them up in the capital market. It's another win-win, by the way, as the government also needs the private sector more than ever in the face of declining oil revenues. It's not just a matter of company shares that can do with a push from authorities. Research and technology, the founding blocks of knowledge-based companies, can go a long way with a little support. The important thing is that to want something, then we would need idea and assistance. We can do it in cellulose industry, petrochemical industry, and IT. For instance, at Paris Technology Park, all knowledge-based companies are doing the same. Packaging is also instrumental. For instance, you have insulin, but as long as you don't have its packaging requirements, you cannot manufacture it. As far as petrochem companies go, the government's extensive investment in petrochemicals is making Iran one of the largest exporters of petrochemical products. Petrochemicals, which are often public companies, feed on oil, but instead of selling oil, they employ thousands of Iranians and increase exports. That's it for today. 
is for tomorrow to see whether we are to be oil queen Iran or petrochem Persia. To follow up, do watch at the same times each week and don't forget to leave your comments and topic requests. Thanks for watching from the whole team and bye for now.